Hello, my name is Kristen Jasko, and I'm here with Christiane. Today, we are doing an AMA for SPN. What did Kristen and Christiane study in undergrad and why? I studied mechanical engineering in undergrad. I chose it because it was very general and I wasn't 100% sure what I wanted to do when I left school. And I knew that I would get to experience a wide variety of things from electrical to thermodynamics. Uh, I also studied mechanical engineering in school. Um, I guess I chose mechanical engineering because my initial intention for engineering was to go into aerospace. Space always fascinated me since I was a very young child. And so I went into engineering with the intention of that. And then that completely switched around second to third year. But I was still happy with the choice of mechanical engineering because like Kristen said, it really opens up opportunities to a bunch of different fields. Have Kristen and Christiane completed a master's program? If so, where? So I have completed a master's program. I did my master's of applied science at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Uh, I actually did my first year there and then my professor who was supervising me moved to Ryerson in Toronto about halfway through my program and I ended up following him there. My degrees officially through Dal, but I got to spend a year on the Ryerson campus and really enjoyed that experience. I also completed a Master's of Applied Science program at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. I actually did my undergrad there as well, and that's how I met my thesis supervisor. Uh, he and I worked together on the solar design team at Queen's, and uh, I got really interested in solar thermal systems, which was his area of expertise. What are Kristen and Christiane's responsibilities in their current positions? I work for Purpose Building. Everyone at Purpose wears many hats, depending on the needs of an individual project and how big the project is, how complicated the client team is. On some projects, I'm responsible for conducting the analysis portion, preparing deliverables, but on other projects, I'm also responsible for supporting others do this and also reviewing their work and sometimes monitoring schedules and coordinating the internal team. So I am an associate with Footprint. Um, in my current job, much like Kristen, I wear many different hats. I mostly manage the delivery of projects that have to do with sustainability and energy efficiency in the built environment. Um, again, depending on the complexity of the project, I might do some analysis work myself, but primarily my days are filled with managing clients, managing client expectations, and making sure we get our deliverables uh, out on time and of a quality that's acceptable. How has Kristen and Christiane's education helped them in the workplace? It's a really good question, and it's something that I don't think I really understood, especially not when I was still in school. But engineering school really taught me how to learn because as a working engineer, you literally never stop learning. Every project is different some way or another, even if it's a similar building type or similar scope of work, you're always coming up against new challenges that require you to continue to learn. So what I realized is that <clears throat> in addition to teaching me a bunch of first principles, it also just taught me how to take in a lot of information, sift through it all, find out what's important and apply the principles that I need to. And you do that every day as an engineer. So that was a big kind of aha moment for me. And it made me realize how valuable my education was. Like people joke, especially engineers, that we had to learn a crazy amount of theory that we will never apply, but it taught us how to do that process, which is the really valuable part. Completely agree with your answer. I think a lot, a lot of the technical background I learn, I do use, but it's not about the technical background. It's about the critical thinking skills and the ability to work with sometimes very limited information to come up with a plan about how you're going to analyze a problem or how you're going to solve the client's problem. I had a colleague who said to me once that every single building is custom built 
It's not like cars where, you know, they make a hundred of the same ones or thousands and thousands of them. And so they're going to have, um, they have a lot of time to spend on that individual design. Every building is completely unique. So you're always learning different things about different buildings and you're constantly surprised by how they're operating or how they were designed. What got Kristen and Christiane interested in the field of sustainable buildings? I mentioned earlier the design team at school that started me down this pathway. It's the Queen Solar Design Team. While I was at school, we were participating in the U U.S. Solar Decathlon, which was about designing a net zero energy house and shipping it down to California at the time. They've since changed the location, I believe, of the competition and seeing how it performed. And so there was a lot of energy modeling and got into some of the general understandings of how buildings worked and I really enjoyed it. Myself, I had a little bit of a crisis of conscience halfway through my engineering schooling. I, um, like I said, I went into engineering with the intention of going into aerospace. Um, when I was going around into third year, when I really had to start specializing in courses, is when global warming and climate change was all that was on the news. And I really felt a little bit guilty that I would devote my career to something that I found fascinating, but maybe not super useful to like imminent problems of today. So I switched, I, I changed what I was looking at. I started looking at and focused my senior years of undergrad on energy systems, renewable energy systems, and when I got into a master's program, it introduced me to energy modeling. And then that's kind of where, where things have taken me since. What is a memorable experience, problem, job that Kristen and Ken have been through? One of the most truly memorable ones is um, when I was growing up, my dad was a general contractor for a very small company. And <laughs> I knew what a tender was when I was like a year old because he would come home either super happy or super not happy having won or lost certain bids. And I'd always hear two very large construction firm names uh, like, dang, we lost two, fill in the blank. So I grew up loathing these two construction firms for no other reason than they beat my dad when I was a little kid. And maybe my second year of working professionally, I got taken to a meeting at a headquarters office for one of these very large firms. And I just remember sitting in this room with some pretty senior people, way more senior than me around the table and just thinking like, if my dad only knew where I was right now, like I'm in the war room of the enemy <laughs> is how like my childhood brain thought of it. Um, and I remember giving him a call after that meeting and telling him he was laughing so hard. He had no idea that I had like internalized this like er feeling towards these companies. So we kind of chuckle about that one. That was probably the more me one of the more memorable ones for me. One I thought would share was just a small thing when I walked into a building a few years back now and it was June, so pretty firmly in cooling season by that point. And we walked into this unoccupied space and looked up at the ceiling and went, oh, there's electric duct heaters in here. That's interesting. And went up and looked at them and touched, like tapped one of them and went, oh, that electric duct heater is on right now. <laughs> it's been on since this building has been built probably. <laughs> and we went through and changed all the thermostats with the office supervisor and went, yeah, no, no one has been in this space yet uh, or since, you know, they, they moved out. And so no one was paying attention to, and the temperature was comfortable. But then that small act probably helped uh, reduce their electricity bills by quite a bit. What are some of Kristen and Christiane's professional goals? For me, the industry is always changing and evolving, and there are a lot of different opportunities out there to see where things go and to follow different uh, market trends as they emerge and as sustainability becomes much more of a hot topic and people are really getting on board with the idea of acting sooner rather than later for climate change. So. Personally, I really want to grow my own personal knowledge around that side of things and see where that takes me.
I don't have any, you know, in five years I must achieve this or be that. Nope. <laughs> There's enough going on professionally and personally that I just kind of want to continue to be learning. And as what Kristen said, as the whole everything, you know, the environment, the marketplace changes and shifts over the next 20 to 30 years, which it will quite dramatically in our industry, I really just want to hang on for the ride and be a part of it. Like it's a really fascinating time to be in this industry, I think, because of how much is going to have to change in our careers. It's just, I just feel like I, I won the lottery a little bit with the industry I'm in and the timing that it's happening. So I just want to be a witness to it and do my best to help clients along the way. What have been some professional challenges in Kristen and Christiane's careers? I've had a few, like I don't want to shy away from some that maybe are pretty obvious. I've definitely experienced sexism in, in a boardroom before. Um, I worked in Alberta for five years. I'm not sure if that <laughs> changes things that much. I, you know, the reality is it still exists. Like at my undergrad that I went to, the women's washrooms were converted janitor's closets because there were no women in engineering when that school was built. So. Things have come a super long way. It's not completely gone. It's gotten better. But that that was a challenge when it was actually happening. I was a little bit in shock that it was. I was like, where's the hidden camera? What's happening right now? Um, but it, it was a challenge and, you know, you, you figure out ways to overcome it. Kind of rolled into that. One of the challenges I find is <clears throat> trying to improve building designs and speaking to designers that are very, you know, well established in their field and have been designing buildings for 30 years. And then up comes this sustainability consultant trying to tell them they got to do things different or better. And that's not an easy conversation to have. And you have to be, you know, you have to develop a relationship or rapport with that person and, and try to come to some common understanding before you start telling them how their design is terrible and is ru ru <laughs> ruining the earth. So, um, I didn't learn that, you know, easily or quickly. There were a lot of awkward conversations over many years with a lot of different people that, but all of them taught me something. And I think I, I'd like to think that I've gotten a little bit better at having those difficult conversations now. It's a really good answer. And I also struggled with this question to think about what's the right way to talk about some of these things like what you met, mentioned, uh, some uh, misogyny that definitely I felt like Yes, I definitely saw the same thing in my mechanical engineering building. Generally felt that my undergrad was relatively sheltered. You know, it was like not a, it wasn't overt, let me say it that way. Whereas when I got out into the workforce, sustainability does tend to be populated by people who mostly are not going to display overt sexism either but you definitely will encounter it, especially as you're saying, when you're dealing with uh, older guards, that you can encounter that as well. And it's definitely uh, with that, I found that I always wanted to prove myself. And so I would work uh, extremely hard and be willing uh, to kind of blur the, you know, take on more work than was probably reasonable for anyone to try to do and so one thing that I had to learn to do is say you know what I need to set some personal boundaries between home life and work life and so when you work in consulting as I'm sure you know they're fast paced so there's always more work to do but at the end of the day you need to be able to set those expectations and uh, boundaries for yourself. What does it mean to decarbonize a building? So to me, it starts with identifying a plan that includes ways to reduce the overall carbon of the building through efficiency activities that reduce the load, usually involving electrifying the systems, particularly any systems that are heating anything, uh, that are burning gas or oil or some other combustion fuel. And then the third piece, the third fundamental activity tends to be procuring some sort of form of renewable energy 
at most buildings in Ontario, the electrification piece is the heavy lift because our heating systems do tend to generally be gas burning and our electric grid is relatively low carbon. And that's the direction that it seems like most of the grids in, uh, in Canada are going right now. But the priority and what the timing for those three efficiency, fuel switching and renewables might vary in different regions with different grid carbon intensities. Yeah, really good answer, Kristen. Essentially, decarbonization is lowering the carbon associated with the building. So it's pretty simple. Um, in theory, in practice, it's exceedingly challenging and difficult, and we're going to be dealing with it for the next 30 plus years. Um, it's, you know, my new favorite term, thanks to the pandemic, is a layered approach. You have to take a layered approach. It's the same thing in decarbonization. There's not one silver bullet. It's many smaller actions layered on top of each other that are going to make you get you to the greatest gains. And then, like Kristen said, the order and timing of those things are going to be different depending on where you are in the country, what the local situation is. But always trending in that direction, always trying to reduce the carbon associated with the building. What are Kristen and Christiane's hobbies? <laughs> Pre being a parent, I played competitive roller derby for 11 years. That was pretty much <laughs> work and roller derby. It's pretty much all I did. I grew up playing all kinds of sports, but I didn't really do any through engineering school because school was a little too much. But pretty much as soon as I graduated, I got into to um, sorry into roller derby. And then when I had a child, that all came to a screeching halt. <laughs> she's seven now and she's playing hockey for her first year. So my hobby is her hobby and I'm her assistant coach on her hockey team right now. But, you know, I just, it, roller derby was too much. I needed to be done with that. And, you know, I like to see where my daughter's interests go and I'll just follow along with her until she's old enough and maybe we can do some of this stuff together. So. I would say my number one hobby is skiing and that's both downhill and cross country. I go as often as I can on the weekends and uh, I've done it since I was three, very passionate about it. And it's also sort of how I got interested into general sustainability as a thing at all was because of the impact that I was even starting to see even, you know, 15 years old from growing up that we were having less snow many winters and comparing to when my parents were young and the photos that they had and talking to them to about it and it built in me a real passion for trying to mitigate the effects of climate change. What is building energy management? Building energy management generally is about First, understanding how your building is performing, maybe comparing it to some peers or an industry benchmark, and then digging deeper and figuring out why does the building perform the way it does? So why does it use more or less energy than your neighbor, the competitor, or other buildings in the same, owned by the same group? And then identifying if the reasons are because of something intrinsic to the building, such as a and in server room that's running 24 seven, burning lots of power to run those computers and then burning power to cool the computers down. Or if it has to do with something more changeable about the building, such as lower efficiency equipment providing that cooling to the server room or because of an operational change, such as maybe the lights are on overnight and they don't need to be because it's an office building and no one's there. That brings in uh, uh, coming up with a list of opportunities to reduce energy, reduce carbon, uh, reduce uh, sometimes utility costs as well. And that process could be through a one-time study or it could be through a continuous improvement program. The last piece that I'll mention about building energy management is that the implementation of these opportunities as well as tracking and celebrating the progress is also a very important part of building energy management.
What does it mean to be a certified measurement and verification professional? So I am a certified measurement and verification professional. Essentially, it's a designation that says um, that a person is qualified to verify savings that a building achieves through energy efficiency measures. So in the before anything takes place in the building, we understand what data we have to show how well a building is performing. The building might undergo some renovations or changes. And then after the fact, we look at that data again to see, did we actually achieve what we thought we were going to achieve? And I had no idea what a certified measurement and verification professional was coming out of university. But in my first job, I was doing a lot of energy modeling for lead projects. And measurement and verification was a component of those projects. And I really liked it because so much of the emphasis was put on designing these really awesome lead buildings. And then we'd walk away. And then a year later, the building owner would come banging on our door and say, hey, I thought my bills were going to be cheaper than my other building. That's why I spent all this money to do all these great things to improve the building. But I'm using the same amount of energy. What's going on? So that led us to really start digging into a lot of our lead projects and realizing that unless you do a lot of things at the end of construction to make sure the building actually operates how it was designed to, it may not. And it may run very inefficiently. Actually. And one of the things I always thought was kind of funny was, you know, you'll buy a $40,000 car and it has a gas gauge and fuel economy real time right there. For a $40,000 car, you spend $40 million on a building and have no visibility into how that thing's operating. And you spend orders of magnitude more on the utilities per month than you do on your car. But you would be super mad if all of a sudden that feature was no longer available on your car, right? But we just don't have that same clarity in buildings. It's gotten a lot better. But seeing that real gap made me want to kind of dig into it more. And, and part of that was the credentialing that went along with it. What do sustainable buildings mean to Kristen and Christiane? Sustainable buildings essentially are buildings that are energy and resource efficient and, you know, if they are not net zero carbon emissions today, they have a plan to be net zero carbon emissions soon. That's a requirement essentially of every bit new building going up and every existing building still standing. Canada is committed to zero carbon emissions by 2050 and buildings are actually considered a low hanging fruit in that equation because we have today the technology, the knowledge to get buildings to that point. So while 2050 is the goal for our country, I think buildings are gonna have to get there a lot sooner. I totally agree with you. It's such a broad uh, question that you're gonna ask a million people and get a million different answers because it's also constantly changing. If you'd asked me a few years ago, what do sustainable buildings mean to you? I would have given you an answer about general energy efficiency and you know, maybe would have talked about LED lighting, whereas now that's not even considered an advanced practice in most places, that's considered like baseline. Uh, and the point that you said about uh, it's about holistically looking at or and minimizing the impact that the building is having on the world around it and trying to offset any impact that it does have that's unavoidable that tends to be the way I look at it now and that can encompass both carbon which is tends to be what I tend to focus on figuring out ways to get a building to net zero carbon which I think is as you said very much where the industry is going but that also may include water and waste as important parts of that story as well. What are Kristen and Christiane's favorite TV shows? This changes all the time for me, but right now my top TV show is probably The Good Place. It's a half hour sitcom format uh, not a super long one, only four seasons, but it's just a very tight show. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the details in case people haven't seen it because there's some really great twists in the plot. So you should just 
watch it if you like um, if you like the creators some of the other creator shows like Brooklyn Nine Nine uh, or The Office uh, or Parks and Rec, which are also great TV shows, you'll probably like The Good Place. I might have to check that out because I was going to list The Office and Parks and Rec as like up there in my list for sure. Superstore, I started watching at the beginning of the pandemic. Have to check out season six. Uh, and then cooking or food, like and literally almost anything on the Food Network. So when it's like cooking time, that's what's on all the time. My daughter gets really mad. Are we seriously watching another cooking show? Um, but yeah, I, I love to cook. So I love to get ideas from the different shows. And I, I don't know, life's heavy, works hard. I like really easy to digest television for my TV time. What advice would Kristen and Christiane give to current engineering students? It's a really good question. I was trying to think, what did I wish I had known when I was doing my undergrad or even my master's? <laughs> and one thing I often say is a piece of advice that I always say that I know most people are not going to take it, but start working on your PNG license as soon as you get a summer job that has anything to do with something that you think you might eventually submit. Just spend half an hour, write it up, make sure whoever you worked with, the engineer is okay with you submitting their name and you will thank yourself later because you will forget everything. And when you spend four years, then you'll go back and try to remember uh, all the different things that you did and you will not remember it. But that being said, I don't think most people do that. So the other thing I would say <laughs> is <laughs> try out a lot of different things. You never know what area is going to spark your interest and get you really passionate about um, whatever it is, whether it even within sustainability or any industry, there is a ton of variety. So if you don't like one particular aspect, don't write that whole area off. Just look at a different field, different type of work, and you will likely find something that you can become very, very passionate about. I guess one thing I would say is engineering school is hard. Like I know everyone says that, but working as an engineer is nowhere near as hard as going to school to become an engineer. It really truly isn't. Once you figure out your work-life balance, which is challenging and it's a constant challenge to do so, it's not as hard. Like I go to work for eight and a half hours a day and come home. In engineering school, that does not happen. So just know that it's not always gonna be as hard as it is in school, but it is training you to be very resilient. It's training you to find out what your limits and boundaries are. Um, but prioritize your mental health. Like sometimes a 90 is good enough. And if it means your mental health, you don't need the 92. It's okay, let it go. Like there's a lot of students that work so, 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 so hard just try to keep that in mind and try even in the face of the immense challenge that is engineering school just try to find a little bit of that balance for yourself so that's definitely one and then once you're either in a co-op or an internship or your first job like Kristen said try everything if somebody asks you hey can you your answer should be yes before they even finish speaking because that's how you get exposed to like all the different little areas within an area and when people at your company know that you're willing, you have a willingness to do that, you'll get called upon to do really cool and awesome things that probably wouldn't cross your path otherwise. Really good. I wanna build off what you said about uh, stressing out over getting, you know, the 92 versus the 90. It's, I definitely did that as well. And the thing that I realized, it's not that grades don't matter. It, they, they do to a certain extent, but they don't matter as much as you think that they do. There are some exceptions to that, depending on what you want to do. If you're looking to go into a very competitive graduate program or something like that, they might matter more. But in general, in industry, people are looking to see, did you do okay? And then it's gonna be more about how do you do in the interview? How are your communication skills? Which is also a thing that I think is really undervalued in engineering school. So working on your communication as well. 
Thank you everyone for listening and please feel free to reach out to Kristen and myself, Christiane on LinkedIn.